Today's show is what we call a bits and pieces show. There's just so much going on, which is worthy of our discussion. So we're going to do our best to round it all up for you. Exactly. But with the 50th anniversary of Apollo 14 underway, we will take a look at the mobile quarantine facility, which was last used after that mission. Don't forget to give us a follow on social media at Space and Things One on Twitter or get involved at Space and Things Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. Please do get in touch if you have any thoughts or opinions on anything we discuss in the show. But right now, it's time for episode 23 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. You're listening to the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 23 of our podcast. What a week. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. So just hanging in there in Florida. Uh, I've heard you've had a pretty good week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad, actually. I had a, I had a new single out on Friday, which was nice, called Elizabeth the First, and that's going down well, which is nice. Uh, but yeah, I also um, I, I've been for those of you who don't know, I've been trying to fundraise to uh, to record my next album at Abbey Road, uh, which is really expensive, and uh, I've booked and paid for ten days in the studio next January. So that's one step closer to happening now. I've, I'm, right now, it's just me on my own standing in a big room uh, with an assistant engineer <laughs> pressing record. So I've now got a year to figure out uh, what I'm doing with that room and if I can afford to employ anyone else. But yeah, it's the most I've spent on anything. So, <laughs> But it's really exciting. That is awesome news, though. That's something. That's a goal you've all, always wanted. So that's I think that's fantastic news. That's really cool. Yeah, it's something I've always dreamed of doing for years and years and years, well, since I was a kid. So, yeah, it's nice to have that that to look forward to as well for next year. Um, yes. Certainly been been walking on cloud nine since I, uh, I sent over that <laughs> that bank transfer. Just so you guys know, uh, Dave, uh, independently of this podcast, he does have a Abbey Road uh, fund. So if anybody wants to uh, donate or help with that, uh, please feel free to do so. I appreciate that, Emily. A few of our listeners already have, and it's very much appreciated. So thank you very much to those who have uh, who have checked that out already. And thank you, Emily, for that. Oh, no problem. But we, we have got so much to talk about this week. So shall we just get, get going with this? Yes, let's crack on then. Let's crack on. Actually, Sorry. funny enough, <laughs> no, no, no. I spoke to my mum this week, and my mum said, when Emily does her English accent, I can't help but laugh. It's so good. Oh, wow, really? <laughs> Yeah. I've been told other things about my English accent. I've been told it's pretty awful. So yeah, well, I've been told it's pretty bad. Well, it's making my mum laugh so I, and smile. So I, I'm glad you're That's doing awesome. that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm glad somebody likes it out there. <laughs> I may have to get you to record it in Abbey Road for me. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Anyway, All let's right. crack on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is really a wild place up here. Lots of stories this week, and it's difficult to know where to start. Uh, we have had just one launch to orbit. Uh, the China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation launched a Long March 4C rocket on January 29th, placing three reconnaissance satellites into orbit. It was the 30th flight of the Long March 4C rocket, with 28 successful launches under its belt now. Uh, there was also, unfortunately, a failed launch in China, though. On uh, February 1st, iSpace, also known as Beijing Interstellar Glory Space Technology Limited, <laughs> that's a heck of a name for a corporation. Is that real? Yeah, that's real. I'm not trolling you. <laughs> okay, for a second I was like, did Dave make that up just to mess with me? <laughs> absolutely not it sounds very random like like uh the latoya jackson intergalactic airport or something yeah. like what <laughs> like okay. that's gonna happen <laughs> that's going to happen it should um okay back to the news i'm so sorry um attempted their second launch of a hyperbola one rocket uh this first launch successfully back in july 2019 but this launch on Monday did not, unfortunately, make it to orbit. Uh, we don't have any more details than that right now. We'll be sure to include what we know in the show notes. Uh, iSpace uh, was also the first Chinese private company to send satellites into orbit. Yeah, we, we really need to do an episode on China. 
since starting this podcast, I've been open to the world of what is going on out there, which I had knew nothing about. So we need to find a guest who can talk us through what is happening out there and what they're doing. I'm sure we can find someone to help us out there because yeah. I'm really out of my depth with all this China stuff. Me uh, too. Uh, but talking of being out of my depth, I'm pleased to say, and now bear with me here, I'm pleased to say that Blue Shift Aerospace launched their first biofuel rocket from Maine on Sunday. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a biofuel is a fuel derived immediately from living matter. Wow. So their rocket, Stardust 1.0, reached 1,219 meters up and then deployed a parachute to come back down again. Uh, I'm trying to learn a bit more about this company. It's a team of just eight people, and their aim is to put tiny satellites into polar orbits from Maine. In their own words, they're hoping to be the Uber to space, providing that true nano launch service for nano satellites. Now, they have two larger suborbital rockets being developed uh, called Stardust 2.0 and Starless Rogue. And they also have an orbital rocket planned called Red Dwarf. Uh, now, who gets the job of naming these rockets? You've got Long March, Hyperbola, uh, Stardust, Red Dwarf, Falcon 9, Starship, Electron, New Shepard, all amazing names. I'd love that job. Uh, anyway, the reason I'm saying I'm out my depth is because this is being widely reported as the first commercial booster powered by biofuel. However, I went on Twitter yesterday and discovered that there's a company called Lea Aerospace, that's L-I-A, and they said they sent their Zonda 1.0 rocket to three kilometers using biofuel on the 23rd of January from their facility in Argentina. So I feel like I must have misunderstood something here because both the BBC and Space.com listed the Blue Shift launch as being the first commercial booster powered by Biofuel. So I've sent some emails and I'm beginning to feel like a proper journalist here, Emily. Wow. No, that's that you're doing your job, which yep. is awesome. I mean, that's that. No, seriously, you're doing you're doing your job. I really like that. I just, well, I was confused more than anything. So yeah, it, no, that's those are good questions because you know uh, I'm kind of wondering the same thing. Like, is it really the first biofuel company? Like, who is the first biofuel company? Because there have been times in research where I'll read something and I'm like, okay, I've heard something different from somebody else. Yeah, let's talk to someone else and see what they say. You know, and yeah. so yeah. That's that's really cool. So yeah, I, I got down and dirty and uh, sent these emails, and amazingly, I heard back. So here's the scoop: uh, the CEO of LIA, Leah, emailed me. His name is Dan Ettenberg, and he confirmed that they did launch on the 23rd, and that the rocket was powered by a liquid fuel rocket engine, and the propellants used were hydrogen peroxide and biodiesel. Uh, if you're like me, you'll probably be a little bit lost right now. But don't worry. According to him, that is the version which I explicitly asked for, which is written as if it's for someone reading Rocket Fuel for Dummies. So there we go. Anyway, he continued and said that they won't launch this rocket again. The main purpose of this flight was to test all systems in flight, which was a success. The next rocket will fly around September and it will be much more advanced and complex. A gimbaled engine will be in charge of the GNNC of the vehicle, uh, which I'm guessing is guidance, navigation and control of the vehicle. And we will attempt mm. uh, a fully VTVL flight. No idea what that stands for. Anyway, he went on to say that sustainability is a key in our company since we are using hydrogen peroxide, which results in a 60% less carbon footprint for each flight compared to a LOX kerosene propulsion system. Uh, LOX is uh, liquid oxygen. I know that one. I know that one. Obviously, I'm not a rocket science, even though I didn't know what LOX was. Um, so I am trying my best to understand all this. But my understanding is that that was indeed a biofuel flight. So um, I then sent Blue Sift an email to find out if they were even aware of Leah and what they'd done. And I heard from Seth Lockman, who's their communications director. Uh, and he sent me a really quite nice email. Uh, he said, we can't say what's in the fuel. Oh, boy. But it's cheaper to produce and more energy dense than industry standard solid fuels for hybrid rockets. Additionally, it is non-toxic and nearly carbon neutral. We are familiar with Leo Aerospace and very happy for their success earlier in the week. It is not just exciting, but critical that more and more people are working to offset the carbon footprint in this new industrial revolution. Uh, Blue Shift is far from the first rocket to use a biofuel or a bio-derived fuel. 
I believe the V2 burned ethyl alcohol. So he's going right back to World War II there, uh, an early rocketry. To my knowledge, he says, we are the first, we are the world's first rocket company to launch a bio-derived fuel-powered rocket with commercial payloads aboard. Oh, okay. So it was semantics. Yes. So I think I've got to the bottom of my confusion. It's the use of the word commercial which makes the following statement true. Blue Shift have launched the first commercial booster powered by biofuel. Anyway, en- enough of me being an investigative journalist, uh, but I have enjoyed this. It, it, it kind of came out of nowhere, this. I, I was reading stories about Blue Shift, and then this company, Lear Aerospace, appeared on my Twitter feed. I wasn't even following them. It was a suggested thing. And it was like this story was was being presented to me that there was something wrong and I had to fix it. And it was being <laughs> it was my responsibility. So I did. Anyway, it wasn't about making a competition between the two. I just wanted to get the facts straight here on what was being reported. Um, but I do love this story and I love what both of them are doing. And I love that they both agreed to come on the podcast this year awesome. to discuss their companies and their plans. But yeah, I just was confused and I hope that the BBC and space.com had done their research with uh before they reported what they did let's hope maybe they'll correct it once this podcast comes out anyway enough enough of me being a journalist (laughs) okay in the last week we've had two different spacewalks at the international space station on january 27th mike hopkins and victor glover spent over six hours outside the space station trying to activate the bartolomeo platform which we briefly talked about last week uh when they were attaching it to the european columbus module of the iss and it's a uh, payload hosting platform made by airbus uh the plan is that smaller experiments can be uh carried out there unfortunately uh three cables refused to connect but the walk was not a uh, complete failure as they were able to fix some technical problems on the station uh It was Victor Glover's first spacewalk, and as always with him, he was a joy to listen to, and there was so much enthusiasm. Mm, On Monday, yeah, he's fun. He's fun. He's brilliant. He's awesome. On uh, Monday, February 1st, the uh, pair were back outside again for the 234th spacewalk in the history of the space station. That's amazing. Yeah. This time, they completed upgrading a job which started in January 2017 of replacing the old nickel hydrogen batteries with new lithium ion ones. They also carried out some other upgrades, but were not scheduled to have another go at connecting the Bartolomeo platform. There are two more spacewalks planned for Expedition 64, with both uh, Kate Rubens and Soichi Noguchi uh, scheduled to don their spacesuits to perform m- more. Uh, why am I stumbling over the word more? More upgrades to the station. I got Bartolomeo right, but not more. I can't. <laughs> why? Okay. Next. Happens to all of us. Um, just before we started to record this podcast tonight, um, SpaceX finally got to launch their SN9 prototype of the Starship rocket at the Boca Chica site in Texas. Uh, SN9 was powered by three Rapture engines, which shut down in sequence before reaching an apogee of around 10 kilometers in at- altitude. Uh, I'm reading this from the mission description on the SpaceX website. Um, it says uh, that SN9 will perform a propellant transition to the internal header tanks, which hold landing propellant before reorientating itself for re-entry and a controlled aerodynamic descent. You keeping up? Good. Um, however, just like <laughs> SN8 before it, it failed rather spectacularly as it was about to land. Uh, the good news is that the explosion didn't seem to uh, get close to the SN10 prototype, which is already on the pad, uh, as it was rolled out on Friday, and the two stood side to by side together on the launch pad, and it looked looked amazing. Um, SN9 has had a number of delays, the last one being on Thursday, after the US Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, failed to grant SpaceX a license for the launch. There seemed to be a bit of a standoff, uh, and it's unclear exactly what the problems are, but I have seen some reports that it's something to do with uh, a change in the flight plan for SN8, which then needed some kind of investigation. So I'm, I'm still trying to get to the bottom of all of that. More investigative journalism required, perhaps. Uh, but it does appear that they, uh, they have resolved that problem. And um, hopefully we won't have to wait too long for the SN10 test because it, it's there, it's ready. They've just got to analyze all the data from this one, I guess, and make any amendments to the, to the software and the hardware as appropriate. Um, 
But it was another spectacular test. We've talked a lot about Starship before. Uh, it looks great in the air. It really is something out of a sci-fi film. And th- there was a great moment just after the big explosion where the SpaceX commentator said, just remember, folks, this is a test flight. Uh, clearly, we need to do a little bit of work on the landing. And that really, really made me smile. Anyway, uh, I th- it They've got all their data, and hopefully we won't have to wait too long for the SN10 flight. Unfortunately, I was at work during the test, but I did see some of the stills uh, after it, and uh, it looks pretty amazing to see something that large uh, fly vertically and horizontally. So that's pretty incredible. Absolutely. And they're they're, they're close. They're close. And they've got their data, so they're happy. Exactly. All right. Well, we have some news on the Space Launch System core stage, which had a failed green run test last month. Well, it looks like we may see the next attempt sometime this month, which should certainly make some of the program's critics be a little quieter. Uh, Let's hope. Uh, (laughs) It's nowhere nowhere near the delay, which was anticipated after the first test, which saw the engines light for just 67 seconds of the proposed 485. Um, While we're talking about announcements, Northrop Grumman will be launching the next Cygnus cargo ship to the space station, from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia on February 20th. And uh, NASA, in partnership with SpaceX, are targeting an April 20th launch for the next Crew Dragon capsule. The Crew 2 mission carrying NASA astronauts Shane Kimborough and Megan MacArthur with Japanese Aerospace uh, Exploration Agency, or JAXA, astronaut uh, Akiko uh, Hoshide, I think that's his name, and uh, European Space Agency, or ESA, astronaut uh, Thomas Pesquet. Uh, I got beautiful. the French name oh right. Oh, my God. Yeah. That was beautiful, Emily. Thomas Pesquet, yeah. He's French dude. He's pretty cool. Um, there are currently seven people on the ISS, but three of those are due back on April 9th when the Soyuz MS-17 mission returns home. However, both the Crew-1 and Crew-2 astronauts and Dragon capsules will be on board for some time together. Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah, I decided not to include the names of the, the uh, Russian astronauts there for you to have to read out there, Emily. I thought I would give you a break with the pronunciations. Yeah. <laughs> I got to display my French speaking skills. I took French, I minored in it in college and wow. never have used it. Never until- have used it in my life until now. So yeah. thank you, Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> Or bonjour, Thomas. While we're talking about announcements, uh, there have been two very interesting announcements this week. Uh, on the 26th of January, Axiom Space revealed the names of the clients of its for its first private funded and operated mission to the International Space Station. The Axiom mission, AX-1, is being planned under a commercial agreement with NASA. It's being slated to launch on a SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, and the crew is Larry Connor, who is a 71-year-old American real estate and tech entrepreneur. He'll become the second oldest man to have been in space behind John Glenn, who was 77 when he got his second flight on the space shuttle. Uh, Eaton Steeb, I hope I've got his name correct, <laughs> um, is a businessman and former Israeli fighter pilot. Mark Pathy, who is a Canadian investor and philanthropist. Plus, there's a retired NASA astronaut, Michael Lopez Allegria, who has 260 days in space on four previous missions and is the vice president of Axiom. It's a 10-day mission, which will have to fit within the current planned ISS schedule, uh, but it could take place as early as January 2022. Now, while there has been private astronauts before, this was scheduled to be the first mission uh, to be fully crewed by private astronauts. The SpaceX Dragon capsule has actually been designed to fly autonomously, with humans actually only needed within certain emergency situations. However... On Monday, February 1st, SpaceX then announced that 37-year-old billionaire tech entrepreneur Jared Isaacman had charted a trip to Earth orbit, as you do. Um, (laughs) As you do, as one does. Um, The mission will be called Inspiration 4 and will use the Resilience capsule, which is currently being used by the Crew-1 mission. Uh, This mission will spend two to four days in orbit, but won't meet up with the ISS. It will be the uh, first ever all-private crewed orbital mission in history. Isaacman is an accomplished pilot and will command the mission, but he is donating the other three seats. He is insisting that the mission is inspirational, so two of the seats are being given to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, which is a leading institution in the United States 
and the fight against cancer and other diseases, and it treats children uh, free of charge. Uh, One of those two seats is going to a uh, St. Jude staff member. Uh, We won't know who yet, but apparently they have picked a woman, and the other seat is a raffle prize. Now, if you're an American citizen, you can get a raffle ticket uh, from the Inspiration4 website. Uh, You don't actually have to donate to enter, but it's for the hospital, so uh, I would do it. I would highly recommend it. Um, Although I did see uh, some debate about whether you'd have to uh, declare the $50 million uh, seat on your tax return if you win. (laughs) So, yeah, that might be a little uh, tricky. Uh, the website, which will be in our show notes, also has uh, information about what is happening to the fourth seat. Uh, it will go to a, quote, deserving entrepreneur who uh, utilizes the new uh, Shift for Shop e-commerce platform. Uh, this is a company which Isaac Men is the uh, CEO for. So uh, there's going to be a big promo launch for this during uh, Super Bowl this weekend. So, yeah, so I guess we're kind of seeing... The dreams of, you know, Gerard K. O'Neill realized about sending (laughs) regular, sort of regular, kind of, not really regular people to space. I don't know. I can't really. (laughs) They're billionaires. Yeah, definitely the Axiom mission is is all billionaires, isn't it? I mean, the the the, what Jared Eisenman's doing is interesting, although he's obviously still a billionaire, but at least he's giving normal people a chance. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> I, I do like that a staff member from the hospital is going to get to go up. I think that is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me of uh, the movie Dumb and Dumber, so there might be a chance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel. So you're, so you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> what was all that one in a million talk? Um, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it's the start of space tourism. Well, it's not the very start, but it's definitely a major step forward in it. Yeah, it, it, it's somewhere. It, it's I do think um, as far as SpaceX is concerned and with we've talked a little bit about this during this podcast, sort of the more I wouldn't say civilian, but I'd say like private companies, uh, companies outside of the auspices of like, say, country space programs like, yeah. you know, NASA, ESA, whatever. Um, I do think it's a we're starting to we're starting to see um, strides towards you know the promise I guess that was extended by certain people whose names I won't drop again in the seventies and eighties you know where it was like okay regular people are gonna have a shot with at this someday you know we kind of saw that happening in the eighties where we had you know payload specialists we had people from private companies kind of hitch a ride on the space shuttle and go to. Granted, it was in exchange for research and uh, yeah. for research and development and things like that. They weren't just, you know, partying on the space shuttle or anything. And then we saw it. Tr- uh, this is kind of a sad example, but we saw it with, you know, teacher in space and things yeah. like that. So we sort of saw, you know, in the 80s, the space shuttle kind of started that. And um, I think now sort of even though, I mean, let's be honest, it's it's largely kind of the domain of rich very rich people i think we're starting to see okay the the private enterprise now is starting to dictate okay regular people might be able non-astronauts non-perfect physical specimens can go to space yeah you don't need three degrees yeah you don't uh, need three degrees (laughs) washboard abs and you know a doctorate you don't need to be a doctor, a lawyer, a scientist, and have washboard abs at the same time, you know? So yeah. we're starting to see, the, I guess, the promise of, you know, what spaceflight maybe, or what I think spaceflight should be, maybe, is that regular people could do this someday. Yeah, absolutely. The one, the one thing that does concern me is that it doesn't interfere with the science which is going on. Agreed. Particularly the Axiom mission, which is going to to the space station. You know, if they're going to be up there for ten days, you don't want them interfering with anything. Maybe, maybe they're going to be doing their own experiments in uh, in the new module, for example, uh, in, which you know would be fine as long as they're trained for that. But they, you you don't want them getting in the way of projects which have been researched and millions and billions spent on, um, just so that some old real estate man can go and have his photo taken in space. Yeah, get a selfie in space, exactly. Yeah. I agree, totally, because there's part of me that's torn, you know, that I do think regular people eventually, maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe eventually, you know, should think about, you know, okay, 
um, maybe humankind should start to look to the stars or something like that. But then there's a part of me that's like, well, the ISS is a scientific platform. You know, yeah. I mean, granted, we've seen things that are a huge departure from that. I mean, we had the Chris Hadfield video a few years back, which, which was amazing. And, you know, but I, I feel there's still a ways to go and, you know, OK, you know, let's see what we can do in space. You know, let's see how we can study the body and study different processes in space. So it, it, yeah. I don't know. I agree. It's kind of like a it's a slippery slope. It's kind of a tricky area. Although if if the Axiom mission is is contributing huge amounts of money towards the International Space Station so that more science can be done, that that's not a bad thing either. So yeah. it's, one, it's one of those things. We don't know the full details of, of the money exactly. that's being changed hands here. Uh, hopefully everyone will be we kept safe and uh, and th- th- those normal people can bring back com- some perspectives for us. As I said, the the the, the idea of uh, a, a staff member from a hospital going up is amazing, and I can't wait to to find out who that is. And the raffle prize, I mean, that's a mate <laughs> win a raffle and go to space. That is it's amazing. Just bananas, it's bananas. That kind of reminds me. Even though she was a scientist, I want to make it really clear she was somebody with the doctorate it kind of reminds me of how helen Sharman, the first yeah. uh british person yes yeah, she i think it was like a competition like a prize you know yeah. and granted she was a scientist i don't want to and i'm not taking credit from that she she's accomplished an awful lot but um it sort of reminds me of that like yes yeah, she won this prize and she ended up going to the mirror i mean isn't that and she ended up being the first british person in space i mean that that yeah. to me is like I love reading about that stuff. So yeah, yeah, regular people doing stuff. Annoyingly though, that happened before social media. Yeah, like Helen's story is one of those ones that just isn't known by enough people. Like Tim Peake is a superstar in the UK, superstar. But a lot of people assume he was the first because they don't even know about Helen. Yeah, and and that's one of the reasons why why Tim is such a superstar. And but it all happened when he could tweet from space and post Instagram photos and all those kind of things to really connect. And he was doing video links with classrooms and having classrooms grow plants at the same time he was growing them in in space. And everyone was connected to it. Poor Helen didn't have that. Uh, so people are kind of beginning to play catch up on, oh, hang on, this happened before. Uh, but it's never quite the same, is it? So, uh, but yeah, this, this is an opportunity to have it. Uh, opportunity, but also that does come with some baggage, but it's an opportunity uh, to have someone go up there with, you know, who's not a scientist perhaps, or she, maybe they are because they work at a hospital, but someone who's, as you say, is a, a normal person like you or I yeah. may have a dodgy hip. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Exactly. not> be, <laughs> you know, and, and it, I, I guess it just gives you and I a little yeah. bit of hope that there, there's yeah. still a chance. There's still a chance. I broke my foot some years ago and it's healed up, but still it hurts sometimes. I'm like, yeah, maybe I could still go to space with that. I'm not going to yeah, walk exactly. on it. So yeah, exactly. I could still, I could get away with it, you know? Yeah. Get, exactly. get your raffle ticket. Just make sure exactly. your tax returns are uh, up to date. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, as well as all this uh, fantastic news we've had to digest this week, it's also been a big week historically. Obviously, as we discussed last week, there have rightfully been many events and tributes paid to the Apollo 1 crew and the astronauts who died in the Challenger and Columbia Space Shuttle disasters. Their anniversaries all fall within the same week. But this week also contains the anniversaries of some more positive stories. For example, on the 31st of January, 1961, 60 years ago this week, uh, it was the date when Ham the Chimpanzee was launched into space on a suborbital flight on a Redstone rocket as part of the testing for the Mercury program. In doing so, he became the first non-human hominid launched into space. Now, he did return safely, and in fact, he went on to live until 1983, where unfortunately he died at the North Carolina Zoo. Uh, The capsule is now on display at the California Science Center in Los Angeles, and in the Air Force Museum in Dayton, they have this great display case which features uh, a flight jacket, a leather jacket that was made for him for when he met President Kennedy. It really is adorable. Uh, So if you're ever in those places, check those out. But 60 years since that first flight, which 
is one of those big historical markers because you hear that the Mercury 7 astronauts were unhappy about this or you read it, you never know who's to, be who's to believe in these scenarios, uh, that they felt that they could have gone up at that point and beat Yuri Gagarin into space. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I think it was uh, maybe a little bit of uh, embarrassment that a, that a, you know, a monkey went first or a chimpanzee went first. For some yeah. reason, I was reminded of a, a story. Dwayne Day wrote a story. I don't know if he's listening to this podcast. Hey, Dwayne, if you're listening to this, hi. He wrote a, a story some years back uh, about uh, Boris the Chimp, and it was uh, like a Russian analog to the American space chimps. And they, he had like a whole crew rotation for like chimp missions and stuff. Wow. And, <laughs> and some people, well, wait, there, it gets even better. Some people took this as like it was real. Because Dwayne's a space, like a space historian. So some people took this as gospel and like it appeared in a, like a Russian magazine. I'm dead serious. So yeah. No way. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of the most hilarious things I've ever heard of in my life. I, uh, yeah. So yeah. Boris the Chimp, if you can find that, check it out. Dwayne's probably going to kill me that I even mentioned it. So hi, Dwayne. To our next story. Um, it is also currently the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 14 mission. We all know uh, who was on that. It was uh, Alan Shepard, the Admiral, uh, first man in space or first U.S. man in space, I should say. Uh, pretty, Still pretty incredible uh, achievement. Uh, mm -hmm. Ed Mitchell, who is the lunar module pilot, and Stuart Rusa, who is the command module pilot. We are going to be joined by a very special guest in a couple weeks to talk more about this mission. Uh, our Patreon subscribers have been informed of this wonderful guest. Um, we've been at the mercy of his schedule, uh, so unfortunately we won't be covering uh, too much of this mission until episode 25, but we think it's a fitting way to honor our 25th show milestone. Um, the Apollo 14 mission, however, was the last of the three moon landings to have a quarantine period when returning. Uh, of course. Emily, did you manage to watch the new Apollo 11 quarantine movie this weekend? I forgot to ask. Yes, I did. Um, it was available in the uh, movie theater uh, pretty close to me. My sister and I went to see it. Uh, we, I was not aware of this. It was actually a double feature with the regular Apollo 11 oh, film. So we got that afterwards, which was wonderful. And it's an IMAX. So it was incredible to see that again in IMAX. And um, because... Uh, of COVID, I mean, we, we we were all protected, but we had the theater to ourselves. And um, I've, <laughs> I was about to say, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but um, here's a spoiler. <laughs> they did go to quarantine after they came back to Apollo 11. So there's a spoiler for you. It, I It's a very short film. Uh, as we discussed last week, it's not very long. I do think um, completists, Apollo 11 completists will be interested in it. Uh, I think people who are not really into space flight will be like, what is the point of this? You know, I see why they released it. it it's really a neat document of how after the mission, they really tried to protect um, the astronauts and people around them from pretend from potential moon germs. I mean, I know that sounds nuts, but yeah. they just didn't know Keep that in con. You know, there's context to that, because think about the times we're living in now, you know, yeah, exactly. I, exactly they just didn't know you know and i just i do think it's kind of a little like a wink and a nod to sort of like okay you know this is what these guys had to do back then to keep themselves safe and you know maybe we should think about doing that now i don't know that's how i took it but um i'll be i'll i'll admit i'm embarrassed to admit it but i'll admit i did not know how extensive the quarantine process was they they were spraying spoiler they sprayed everything down after them. Everything was being sanitized. It was it was very similar to what it must be like in a hospital right now. Right. I don't know if regular people will be interested in it, but um, I definitely think space enthusiasts will be interested in it because um, it, it just really shows you how extensive that whole process was. And for me, that was kind of unexpected because now we think, oh, yeah, moon germs, whatever. But I, I enjoyed it, and it was, I mean... Do you think it should have been the other way around? Do you think they should have played Apollo 11, then played the new one? I sort of like that they played the new one first because I'm thinking the people who are probably seeing the new one are people who were obsessed with the last movie. I mean, I know people who aren't really even into space flight that much. I mean, they, they, 
they sort of are interested in it, but they're not enthusiasts. Like, they don't follow everything like you and I would. I know people who saw it like four or five times in the theater because they were just like, I mean, it, this is incredible. Like, I, they'd never seen a launch like that before in a film. So um, I think this, uh, I think having it before the film and sort of having the film as like a, a surprise almost or sort of a bonus is a nice move because people will get to like fall in love again, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I sort of like the way they did it, so... Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Enough. Well, I can't wait to watch it because I am a completist and I am excited about seeing uh, seeing that film. And I guess the the most famous images from that quarantine period uh, are of the astronauts in the mobile quarantine facilities. The the big silver tin cans, which were actually converted airstream trailers. Um, in fact, many people actually are guilty of thinking that they were in that trailer for the whole of the three weeks they were in quarantine. So hopefully the movie is uh, going to correct a few people on that. Yeah. Spoiler, yeah, the movie shows otherwise. It shows um, it shows the entire process of quarantine, which honestly, and I hate to interrupt you, is much more extensive than... Um, than you realized. Than I think anybody realized. It was super, very intense. Yeah, it's, it's not something I think is particularly well documented and most people just see the photo of the astronauts inside the little window, behind the window in the mobile quarantine unit and aren't aware that actually that, that unit was used to transport the astronauts from where they were picked up from Splashdown to the Lunar Receiving Laboratory Facility, which is in Houston, which actually was only knocked down quite recently. Yeah, I think it, I think it was knocked down about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, because it was, so? it fought, cause obviously it wasn't being used. It fell into disrepair. I think there was some asbestos or something like that, some issues. Yeah. Uh, so, they, they, yeah, they couldn't, unfortunately, couldn't preserve that that facility, uh, which is a shame. But anyway, there were three different uh, mobile units used. Uh, there were four made. Uh, and, and the last one was, of course, used on Apollo, th- uh, Apollo 14, 50 years ago uh, next week. Uh, and that one is actually on display on the USS Hornet, which is the ship which collected the Apollo 11 and 12 crews uh, from the sea after their splashdown. And that's currently in Oakland, California. I've yet to visit that one, um, but I hope to. That's on my list of places I really want to go. They've got a great display out there, apparently, uh, and that's part of it. Um There are two others on display. The Apollo 11 mobile uh, facility is at the Stephen F. Udvar Hazy Center, which is the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, which is outside of Washington, D.C. by Dulles Airport. It sits underneath the Space Shuttle Discovery and uh, and near the Gemini 7 capsule. And the Apollo 12 mobile quarantine facility is at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center in Huntsville. While the astronauts were in these units, um, they were joined by a physician and an engineer who ran the unit and also powered down the command module. So I've seen two of these things. They they really are quite small, but I suppose once you've come out of a command module uh, for for 10 days, they probably seem massive. Um, So they probably didn't get too many complaints at that point. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of, um, if uh, for those of you who may have been in the military or the Navy, it kind of, the setup they had for the sleeping with sort of, um, it reminds me of the racks, that's what they were called, Right, they were kind of like bunks that were on one on top of the other in the uh, Navy. Kind of the same setup there. Um, not much space. You maybe had like a foot and a half, maybe a foot to like, you know, raise up, like raise yourself up in bed. So not the most luxurious accommodations and not very large. But I'm sure after spending, you know, over a week in space in the the tiny compartment with two dudes... Anything yeah. was better, you know. Anything was better than that. And uh, of course, after fourteen, they they weren't used anymore. Like uh, I, I know uh, Al didn't have to. Al Warden didn't have to stay in one of them. It's not clear where the one that was made for the Apollo thirteen mission has ended up. Uh, I haven't been able to find any information about that. But the the one from the Apollo twelve mission has a wonderful story. In the seventies, it was turned over to the Center for Disease Control. Uh, who used it to transport scientists back to the U.S. after they'd been exposed to a dangerous virus in Sierra Leone. Uh, But after years of storage, uh, the CDC reportedly handed the mobile quarantine facility over to the Georgia Department of Forestry for use as a mobile command center, where it was reportedly destroyed by a fire. And for years, no one could dispute those claims. Um, 
But what happened was that a member of staff at a fishery um, suddenly had visited the Air and Space Museum and saw the Apollo 11 one, came back and realised it looked a bit suspicious. This this unit they had in the fish farm was a bit suspicious. It looked identical. So they contacted uh, the, some people at Huntsville and the staff there went out and had a look and turned up and it was, in fact, serial number number two, uh, the, the missing quarantine unit. So, of course, uh, the, the Huntsville Museum ended up taking ownership of that and have restored it and they've done a great job with this restoration emily you've been there i've been there they've restored it as it would have been for when um pete comrade al bean and dick gordon were on board so it's really well done there. exactly exactly yeah i love the fish farm story because apparently apparently it was a real good fish farm from what i've heard too <laughs> and they didn't want to give it up so they were like uh, do we have to and it's like uh yeah we would like it you know so yeah Pretty funny story. Yes, yeah, a really funny story. And uh, but it's not like they've wasted this unit. They've restored it really well, and it's sitting there proudly next to the Saturn V rocket uh, yeah. in Huntsville. But these mobile quarantine facilities, there are four of them. We know where three of them are, and uh, they're a pretty important piece of history. Obviously, they're made famous in these great photos, and now a film. Uh, but they're, they're important, and it's great that three of them have been restored and are on display for us to being able to go and visit. And of course, that one on the USS Hornet would have been being prepared 50 years ago uh, to receive some astronauts from the Apollo 14 mission. Um, and that's a mission, I know we're going to talk about it in a couple of weeks, but I am a little bit annoyed that I'm not seeing more online about this. Uh, I haven't seen many events planned. If we see any, we will obviously share them and hopefully people will want to go and learn more about this mission. Um, there's a great Twitter uh, resource called Apollo 50. If it's Apollo underscore 50, if I don't know who runs it, but it's similar to what Ben, we talked about with Ben last week. Essentially, it's programmed to tweet out exactly what was happening 50 years ago. It exists throughout the years, always tweeting out what was going on in the history or in the build-up to the flights. But during a mission, it's fantastic. And you see the correspondence or the between Capcom and the space uh, and the space capsule. Um, it's just wonderful. And you learn so much about the missions as these things are going on. So it, this is a mission I just don't think enough people know, know about and... Uh, I'm looking forward to really, really getting into it. And especially in the context, it's only nine months since Apollo 13 and the near disaster there. And the way they seem to turn that over so quickly with doing a full investigation, making changes and getting Apollo 13, Apollo 14 back out, um, it's really quite fascinating. So I'm looking forward to finding out more about that and, and whether that added any extra pressure. Absolutely. And they also ran into some problems, so yeah, that'll be interesting exactly. to talk about. It wasn't it, it wasn't I mean, a smooth flight. It was not smooth, so it'll be no. interesting to discuss those issues and you know how they got through them. Yeah, especially with the again the fact that it was after Apollo thirteen, they yeah. could not have any more accidents. Oh yeah, uh, this had to go well. They had to they had to land on the moon on this one. Um, so anyway, we will discuss this more, but. Uh, if we obviously, as I said, if I hear of any events going on, we'll be sure to put them on our social media. Yep, absolutely. Ron, you're not gonna believe this. It looks uh, just like the map. So one last thing before we go, Emily, I saw you post in Space Hipsters this week about a new Apollo 16 movie you discovered, Apollo 16 Remastered. It's on the Homemade Documentaries YouTube channel. Did have you actually managed to watch this, or is this just something you've shared with a group as a point of interest? I haven't watched the entire thing yet. Um, I've watched parts of it. Um, I, I I stumbled across it because uh, a friend of mine, Simon uh, Craigar uh, Jr., uh, did some art in the film that was shown. So uh, I did stumble upon it because of him. Uh, he And he's a fantastic artist. I, I haven't watched the entire thing, but uh, I watched parts of it. And it, it, I, love, I love Apollo 16. I think it's a funny mission because if you listen to them talking to each other on the moon, it's hysterical. Yeah, it's like listening yeah, to two good old boys chilling on the moon, you know. But um, I haven't watched the whole film yet, but I, I do think um, it deserves a glance. I think the gentleman who runs the uh, channel on YouTube has done other Apollo yeah. documentaries. I had a look. There definitely are some others on there. So, yeah, if it's any good, I will, I'll probably go through all of them because uh, I I'm, I'm always love a new documentary, So yeah. especially about that era. 
I need um if I don't get a a, a commemorative uh, Apollo 16 Fisher space pen with an engraving on it next year that says Charlie something happened here, um, <laughs> I quit. I quit. That's all I want. Something happened yeah. here, Charlie. Uh, maybe we could do that as our, our official merchandise of the of the year for next year. Yeah, <laughs> the Apollo sixteen commemorative P- pen. Pen, yeah. Why Ink not? Pen Let's do it with the engraving of John breaking the heat flow experiment. Beautiful. <laughs> Why not? Anyway, I'm going to put a link to that in the uh, in the show notes. If you go on our website, I'm embedding. Anytime I mention a video, it gets embedded onto the front page of our website as well when the, when the week's up. So uh, you'll you'll see it on there as amongst amongst other videos from this week. Anyway, that's all we have time for this week. Uh, it's been an action packed podcast full of various bits and pieces. But next week is Mars Mars week, and no matter what happens, we're going to have a focus on Mars because we've got three missions reaching Mars very soon. Thanks to those who joined our Patreon this week. Uh, We really do have some great things lined up for the next few months, and even more things are getting confirmed almost daily at the moment. My inbox is keeping me very excited. So please do be sure to go and sign up and become the first to find out about these things, as well as having access to full interviews, some bonus uh, merch, and bonus content. So, Plus, you're also really helping us and supporting us doing this, and that is uh, greatly appreciated. Sure is. Uh, Many thanks to all of you for listening and for pressing that share button. Uh, It was nice to see people post about enjoying the podcast over the last week, and we're glad that so many people enjoyed our interview with Ben Feist as much as we did. Uh, We're also still hearing from people about the alternative history episode with more suggestions. Uh, Thank you for that. Uh, We'll do an update at some point, I'm sure. Uh, You've given us a hell of a lot of reading to do. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I need more hours in the day. Especially seeing as we've been given access to a certain Apple TV show early. Oh, but anyway, uh, th- <laughs> more on that later. Anyway, thank you for listening, and we hope to see you next week. Uh, but remember, in space, no one can hear you stream. Space and Things has been brought to you by And Things Productions.